Welcome back. This is still July, July, January, January 13th, 2020. This is the Education Committee in the Vermont House of Representatives, and we are continuing our uh, listening tour of how are we doing? How are the schools doing? How are the children doing? And I'm delighted to have three principals to join us. We've just listened to five superintendents. Now we're gonna get to hear what's happening inside the buildings, the virtual buildings and the physical buildings in the school and, and very much appreciate your coming. I think we'll start with Chris Young, principal of North Country Union uh, High School. And uh, welcome, Chris, thank you so much. How are, how are we doing? How are the children? <laughs> the, the children are great. Uh, I, I wish we could have them all in all the time. Uh, that's what keeps us coming back. And uh, I appreciate your reference to uh, July. I've done the same thing several times and it kind of feels like we're doing the same thing again and again. And uh, I do appreciate the, uh, the opportunity. This is my first uh, chance, I think, to speak to the House Ed Committee. Um, and so I hope I don't botch it too badly. We'll, we'll build up with Erica and then Bob with a big finale at the end. I'm sure he's, he's our most polished speaker uh, for VPA. Um, so uh, I, I, a little bit about myself. I, I'm uh, the, the principal at North Country. North Country is about a 700 student school up in the Northeast Kingdom. Uh, with that obviously comes some geographic isolation, some poverty issues as many parts of our state uh, experience. Um, I'm myself a graduate of North Country, uh, Go Falcons, 88. Um, so I'm very, very honored to be here. This is my second year as a North Country principal. Um, prior to that, I was in both Crasper and Troy. This is my uh, 19th year as a principal in Vermont, 21st overall. So um, that makes me feel really old just saying that. Um, so uh, I, I, what I thought I would do um, is maybe just give you a little bit of, of our, our journey uh, since closure in March. I think it, it's important to go back to that a little bit uh, because it does set the, the stage for a lot of our decisions and a lot of um, systems that we put into place uh, to operate school safely uh, beginning in September. Um, and uh, in what we have done, uh, and I think it's worth noting is that um, in the spring, when we were all faced with this emergency closure, uh, it, it began a problem solving exercise that has not yet ended. Um, we, we are constantly faced with new guidance and new challenges. And, um, and it was immediate at that time. Um, and the, the, the biggest problems that we faced as we approached the end of the year were really our making sure that our seniors were well supported so they had every opportunity and to finish. Um, we essentially extended the school year by two weeks. All the teachers signed on for additional two weeks. We compensated them uh, to be available to help seniors sort of get past that finish line. And then we rolled right into summer school to do, to do the same for underclassmen. Um, at the same time, we, we did a lot of our decision-making in committee form. Um, we had committees on scheduling, committees on transportation, committees on food, uh, committees on direct services. And, and, and so my point to this is that that Teachers have really been at this um, since March and with very little break. And so, uh, and willingly, I, everyone wants to be part of the solution and to make sure that things go, go super well. So I'm incredibly proud of my staff and I know that's sentiments that are felt by a lot of my colleagues throughout the state as well. Um, the, uh, as the guidance came out and we were processing it um, in our committees, it, it led us to believe that we could not operate school safely with all of our students, all 700 students coming in. So that got us to a hybrid system. I'm sure you, you've heard the term. Uh, that means that half of our kids are here on Mondays and Thursdays and half are here on Tuesdays and Fridays. Uh, Wednesday is what we call, it's a remote day, uh, but we do open the building for students who sign up for extra help or to come in for activities and really have spent a ton of time just trying to make this as normal as, as we possibly can. Um, for the most part, this has worked. Our, our mass compliance has been excellent. Uh, our physical distancing, less so. <laughs> They're high school students. We allow them to change classes. Uh, I'm pretty confident that uh, they do not spend any more than five minutes or so, that they're not physically distanced from one another. All the classes are physically distanced. The lunch areas are physically distanced, but when they change classes, they are not six feet apart, but that, that time is limited. Um, and, uh, and for, again, for the most part, it's worked. Uh, we, we've had one uh, 
positive case where a student was infectious at school and we ran through the protocols and uh, we determined that the only close contacts for that student uh, were uh, part of his tech center program and uh, that meant that we and our tech center is adjacent to the high school so there was certainly some some, some cross pollination there between the two programs but uh, we did not have to close. Uh, we were able just to continue uh, doing what we did and uh, just that one cohort of uh, tech center students were quarantined for two weeks and then we're back to back to our new normal. Um, but, but I think that the, the, the problem becomes what, what do we mean by it's working? <laughs> you know, we, we have this, uh, when we look at our, our data, and I don't have any hard numbers for you, um, I'm sure you've heard the term ghosting, uh, if you hadn't, ghosting is uh, when students completely, uh, you lose co complete contact with students. And we're estimating somewhere in the 10 to 15% of our student population falls into that category. Um, and it's, it's just a really, it's heartbreaking uh, to know that there are some students that are not accessing any uh, educational services right now. Uh, we know that students rely on being physically in the building for mental health services, for direct instruction from case managers, for food security, for physical safety, uh, for access to our, our nurse, um, and access just to trusted adults. And, and, a, and a good portion of our kids are just not getting that right now. Uh, we have another good chunk of kids in the 20 to 30% range who are um, kind of playing along and doing the minimum of what they need to to be engaged. Um, and, and another 50 to 60% who are doing what we would like them to do and, and to be available for learning as much as they possibly can. Um, one of the things we have learned is that that remote learning uh, disproportionately negatively affects students who are already the most vulnerable. I, I think that is absolutely inescapable for us. And that whether that means uh, difficult family situations or lack of IT, or food insecurity, whatever that means, that they are the ones who are impacted most by uh, being us being in, in a remote uh, situation. Um, so the this this ghosting, this this partial engagement pre prevent uh, excuse me presents some um, some immediate challenges for us. Again, we're, we're going we're going to be ending our first semester in just a couple of weeks. We already know that we will have students who are going to not pass their classes because they have not done any work and they got attended. Um, and we have been, we've added staff to, uh, to provide more opportunities uh, for students to engage. Uh, we are looking at a night school model to begin for the second semester where, you know, we would design that to be fully remote. If that worked for students, we would allow students to come in if that were whatever we can do to, to get them back into the, the building and back engaged, we are willing to do. Um, and, and so those are, are real issues that, that we're confronting right now, going back to that, you know, that problem solving mentality. Um, the, I guess one of the things I would, I, I would like to, to share that most concerns me is that um, there's a bigger problem. And that is, you know, what, do, what does remote learning and the hybrid system impacts all students, not just our most vulnerable. And I'll give you an example to try to, try to make my point. Um, after Wednesdays of the last Wednesday's events, um, I walked into uh, a couple of our social studies classes, and uh, and normally they are, as you can imagine, full of opinions and banter and discussion, and and it was silent, uh, and it was it was just it was actually it was heartbreaking to me because this is a such a significant moment in our history. And I encourage teachers, you know, we need to have these conversations with students and, and, and students were, they were six feet apart, they were wearing masks. Some students were uh, on our uh, smart board having logged in on Google Classroom and were trying to follow the discussion that was happening in class and the, the teacher was doing his best to elicit comments and conversations and debate. And it, it was just, it was just not the same. <laughs> And, and so that is, I think, one of our biggest challenges uh, going forward is, is not necessarily just recovery, uh, but, but really re-engaging our students in what we would consider to be a valuable school experience. And um, 
I mean, we've learned a lot. We, we, we'll rethink. We'll, we'll never do technology the same. This is it's been we've accelerated light years from where we were uh, just a year ago. Um, but our next challenge, and it's a it's a bigger one, is is how do we and we 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 understand that there are some questions about recovery and some questions about. Um, what a recovery plan looks like at the state level and, and from our AOE. Um, I tend to use the word re-engagement rather than recovery. Uh, I think it's, it's a more appropriate way to describe the, the task that we have in front of us. Um, and again, I'll, I'll give you another you know, example. Is it's this, the, the, the night school uh, example I just, or, uh, idea I just shared with you. Like we know that that is unlikely to grab students who are already disengaged. Um, we're looking at ways to uh, create opportunities for students to redevelop meaningful relationships with their peers and adults and get at the underlying issues of why they were not attending to begin with. I and mean, I was an elementary principal for, for nine years prior to coming back to the high school and uh, and they have a great model uh, for their after school program and, and their summer program, which is, uh, is based on embedding academics into wellness activities and skills activities. And, and so we need the flexibility um, to go forward with when we talk about re-engagement and recovery, uh, the ability to make some decisions um, based on our own context. And um, it's something that I, I hope that, you know, can be discussed at, at the at the higher levels here, where um, the problem really is not providing more classes and more opportunities for students just to access content. The problem is finding ways to really build, you know, rebuild those relationships um, and re-engage students in in school. Um, you know, I think this this idea of physical distancing has taken on a life of its own. I, I think that. Now it is not just physical, it's emotional distancing. And I think that's what I saw in that class. And so we need to find ways to bridge that, that distance. And so I will uh, either turn it over for questions or comments or allow my esteemed colleagues to take it from there. I think what we'll do is we'll hear from um, the three principals and then open it up to a uh, conversation from there. I know that we're, we're, we're anxious, anxious to for questions as well. Um, so we will go to Erica McLaughlin from Randolph Elementary School. Good morning. Thanks for having us. It's really a, a privilege to be able to share with you kind of our experiences. This was not an easy task to sort of sort through what to share with you. I feel like I could have written a novel and I needed to not because I didn't have time. <laughs> um, I have written some remarks down and shared them with you. I understand that they're accessible to you. So I am 16 years here at Randolph Elementary School. I live in Minden on the other side of the mountain, but people are like, why do you do the commute? And it's because you build relationships and connections with staff and families. And I just can't break myself from that. So <laughs> here I am. Um, I'm gonna read my remarks if that's okay, just because um, there's so much to share. I'm just gonna rein myself in uh, reading, reading my remarks and happy to answer questions later. So without a doubt, the past 10 months in a school looks drastically different from anything we've ever seen before. Last year, we wrote to our community in our town report, our elementary schools continue to engage in a process of maximizing the opportunities to learn for all students, which is what we are driven to do even this year. The only difference is that we've had to do things very differently. The disruption that came to all of our lives as a result of the pandemic brought uncertainty and fear of change, as well as the opportunity for collaboration and creativity to our schools. This year has reminded us that our schools are a vital part of the academic, social, and economic webs that unite and strengthen all our communities. In the Orange Southwest School District, we have the privilege of working together and we function as an elementary team, not just the administrators, but the teachers. And during this crisis, that team effort was never more needed or appreciated as we learned together, supported each other, celebrated our successes together, 
and even grieve together. This year has not been without many tears. It has been a sad, hard time for everyone and our efforts to work together paid dividends. We were forced to reinvent every system and every routine in our schools, from selecting teachers to teach our remote learners to accommodate family and teacher requests, adjusting how we taught our students, where they ate lunch, where they engaged in learning in their unified arts classes, such as art, music, library, and PE, how students arrived in the morning off the buses or from their parents, how they were dismissed in the afternoon. We even had to think about the movement patterns within our buildings and how students and staff would move around the building safely to minimize distancing or to minimize closeness and to increase distance. All this and more was no small feat. And this was not the case. This was the case in every school. And it continues to be the case every time the modality of learning changes from week to week and sometimes day to day in a week. We have learned a number of lessons while other ideas were reinforced through this pandemic. Our staff and students are resilient and can adjust effectively and efficiently in a crisis situation. Teachers across our state spent an inordinate amount of time last spring, summer, and fall learning innovative ways to teach children in remote settings and with a few days notice switch to in-person learning to keep our students moving and safe. Our students learned how to better use technology as a learning tool, no matter what the content. They're often seen now teaching their family members at home how to access the school's learning hub to see their assignments and join school meetings through Google Meets or Zoom. Education has never turned on a dime like it did this year. We learned that all of our students thrived with smaller class sizes, particularly students that have a lot of stress in their lives. Those students had much more one-on-one -on -one time with their teachers, were more relaxed and demonstrated a greater ability to focus on learning and content with peers in healthy ways. Trauma specialist, Dr. Bruce Perry would tell you relational density matters. And that was evident in positive ways in our classes with fewer students during our hybrid learning sessions. Smaller class sizes contributed to our children being better emotionally regulated so they were more available to access their learning when they were able to be in school. We learned that professional development we engaged in in our district around trauma-informed practices was critical during this traumatic time. It was imperative we put those practices into play with learning what we know about kids that are experiencing ongoing toxic stress at home and what it does to a workforce experiencing that intense stress as well. We learned that our youngest students can navigate technology tools to practice top concepts in ways we had not explored before. Teachers learned how to effectively use new technology tools and video record concepts for students to learn and review lessons. We learned some students do better with remote learning with fewer distractions and fewer transitions, while others desperately needed in-person instruction with their teacher and peers to thrive. We learned remote meetings can be effective for including staff from across the districts to collaborate. And our singleton teachers in our small schools did not need to go this journey alone. Teachers across schools are meeting weekly, planning together, reviewing state, student data together, and participating in professional development together. The OSSD, we learned this a long time ago, doing this work together is better than going it alone. Well, to this point, I've shared with many of the successes in this crisis, we have experienced many challenges, all of which I cannot share in the short amount of time we have together. At the forefront of those challenges are the great inequalities we see. We still have families without internet, students home alone that do not have family there to support their distance learning or to provide for their emotional needs. Supporting these students during the crisis has been of our, one of our biggest challenges. Schools are faced with significant budget challenges for the remainder of this year and perhaps for years to come due to the spending that was needed during this unforeseen crisis to open our schools and to keep us all safe. We had to purchase PPE and disinfecting supplies and additional furniture in order to distance our students, all of which were unbudgeted necessities. I find myself wondering whether we will have an accurate accounting of the impact of the coronavirus has had on our local budgets and what the tax burdens to our communities will be. 
Will it be clear to our communities that these hardships will be felt by the state as a whole, not just our own individual districts? Will it be clear that the tax increases are not because schools were not being fiscally responsible? That's often the rhetoric we hear. With requirements for quarantining and waiting for results, schools are faced with not having enough staff on a day-to-day -day basis, and the shortage of available substitutes has been exacerbated by this pandemic. Schools are faced with feeding our children, providing mental health supports for them and their families. Schools are faced with staff that worry they are going to get their students ill, become ill themselves, or even bring COVID home to their loved ones. Our teachers signed up to inspire and educate the youth of our communities. I would add they did so in incredible ways. They did not sign up to go to work to put their lives at risk by being frontline essential workers, but that's where they are each and every day. It is irresponsible to expect educators to work in a congregate setting without providing them all available precautions, protections. The governor has made it a priority to get students back to in-person learning as soon as possible and should make it a priority to make sure that educators receive the vaccine with the same expeditious timeline. While schools are given guidance on safety measures, putting them into practice as a whole other matter. <laughs> I challenge anyone to come into a school and to keep six-year-olds three feet apart. It's not possible on a consistent basis. It's not uncommon to see a child melt on a teacher's lap or to see a child show their gratitude with an enthusiastic hug to the adult that just helped them through a struggle. So I implore you to insist that school staff be given priority to receive the vaccine. Schools are faced with ambiguous and ever-changing guidelines. The target keeps moving. Announcements at press conferences that require action by the schools without previous notice along with pushback from state and local unions regarding that guidance. A rock in a hard place does not begin to describe what it feels like much of the time. Schools are faced with shouldering the need to stay open to ensure workers can work in order to keep our economy going. The pandemic, sorry, schools have students that are depressed, anxious, or stressed on a normal basis. And the pandemic has compounded these issues due to the difficulties families face while struggling to work, pay their bills, and support their children's education. Social isolation has brought about an increase in domestic violence and addiction, all of which impacts our children. We provide a safe haven for children, a place where they can socialize with other children and be educated. Schools shoulder the needs of our communities and often without gratitude. Despite all those challenges, we are driven to serve our communities and in the end, we will be stronger for this. Thank you. Thank you very much. And that uh, the, the written testimony is on our website if you just go under today or under um, Erica's name. And I think we're still going by first name on our website in, in terms of alphabetical order. Um, thank you so much. And Bob Thibault, principal of Leland and, Leland and Gray um, Middle and High School. Um, yes, thank you. And thank you so much for inviting us. As uh, my uh, predecessors here have, have mentioned, uh, uh, I think Chris set me up <clears throat> to be an eloquent speaker. I don't know if I can follow Erica, never mind Chris. Um, so I, I will say I do have some um, bullet points that I've shared with you guys as well. Um, so yeah, um, my name is Bob Tebow. I'm in my 27th year in education, mostly in Vermont, uh, to my 12th year as a principal. Um, and I'm currently the president of the Vermont Principal Association. Um, as such, I've been involved with a lot of things at the state level, including the sports restart committee, um, and also um, Secretary French's advisory committee um, as well with weekly call. So um, I've, I've had the ability to um, be pretty involved in a lot of the things that have been happening, which has been very interesting, giving me a lot of good insight. Um, Leland and Gray is, a, is a, what I would say a small rural school, um, not unlike most in Vermont. Uh, we do have the distinction of being the alma mater of uh, your colleague, Miss Emily Long. Um, so uh, you can pass on here in regards to her. Um, we are located about 17 miles northwest of Brattleboro uh, on the road Route 30 that heads up to um, Stratton and eventually into Manchester. Um, we have just under 300 students, grades 6 through 12. Um, and we serve a variety, a number of commu different communities. Um, I'll start off with a quick comment about um, broadband access, which I know has been a topic of great uh, conversation at the Statehouse. 
um, we, you know, of our nearly 300 kids, we, we only had five families that had zero access. And, and so it, it feels like that's a pretty good number. Um, the challenge is we have probably have a third of our kids who are operating on uh, DSL in some of our more rural communities. And that access has, um, has been stifling for a lot of families as they have multiple kids or parents working from home and trying to access education through Zoom. Um, you know, the DSL just does not provide the ability to to have uh, the high speed that a lot of the other families um, might have. So even though most of our families have it, um, have internet, it's, it's not always high speed. It's not always um, very good. Um, and as, as well, we've had, we've explored opportunities to bring in boosters and do different things, but all those rely typically on having cell service, which we also do not have due to the topography. Um, we're in a very mountainous valley type region like much of Vermont. And so the cell, cell signals um, don't extend too far out of Brattleboro um, or from Manchester. So we're kind of in that middle area. Um, <clears throat> and so that's a little bit about where we're at from a broadband perspective. So we're also unique in Vermont in that Leland Gray, I believe right now is the only school, the only public school that is still fully remote. Uh, we did not reopen live with students in uh, the fall, uh, and that has to do with our building and our and our school board's decision to to really dig in deep to the um, <clears throat> the AOE guidance on airflow to ensure <clears throat> that our students and staff were were in the safest possible environment. Unfortunately, like many many schools in the state, uh, we're it's not a new building, and there's been tons of deferred maintenance as budget constraints have, uh, as the board has moved to, you know, keep programming, but cut money to the building. So over the years, that's been a conscious decision. And so um, a lot of repair work had to be done before we can even be tested in our district for the airflow. Now, that being said, we also have uh, three elementary schools that are part of our district. Uh, those were obviously the priority to get the kids in there first. So the work really went went to those schools uh, first. That's Townsend, Newbrook, and Jamaica Village School. Um, those schools, two of the three of them are working with live students and Townsend, the third one is set to open very shortly. Um, our air quality and air, air flow testing will be done the last week of this month. And we're, we're on schedule to have kids in the building uh, using that hybrid model uh, that was referenced earlier um, by February 8th, with the exception of our sixth grade, which will be here four days a week. Um, so that's where we're at as far as our building goes. Uh, we have also developed a full-time remote academy for the spring semester for families who are opting to stay remote. But we have been remote since March. Um, and that obviously the impacts that, that Chris and Erica talked about um, from the spring, that for us has been an, a nonstop reality since then. Um, so just so folks are aware of that, that impact. Um, Chris mentioned the term ghosting. I think that's a great uh, descriptor of the lack of engagement that we have seen from students. Um, Erica pointed out that some students do better in this and that's absolutely true. We've seen that at the high, high and middle school level as well. Um, but there certainly has been this sort of slow decline of engagement I would, I would define it as since March. Um, we upticked again in, in the, you know, the beginning of September and then as it you know, each, it starts to decline with engagement and then there's a little bit of an uptick and then vacations kind of starts to decline again. Um, students, as you guys look at a Zoom screen right now, you have uh, all faces on your Zoom screen. I think if you were to ask a teacher in Vermont what they would see, they might see a face or two and a lot of names. Um, I see Aaron uh, nodding. Uh, as an educator, you can, you can speak to that. Um, there, there's a lot of black screens. Kids will put stuff in the chat, maybe. Um, but the, there's not a lot of engagement even in those virtual classes as they go. The teachers, as pointed out by uh, Erica and Chris, are working their tails off to do their best to try to engage using all sorts of different strategies and techniques, technologies, um, but that struggle is real and the kids, the kids are sort of fading um, from that. So it's really essential to have them in, uh, in the classroom. Um, we have had over the, the course of the fall, seven students drop out out of our high school population of about 180. So seven as a number doesn't seem exceptionally large, but out of 180, it's a pretty good percentage. Um, these are all students who um, are all in poverty, uh, who all either needed to get jobs or had to, had to, or have jobs. Um, and they were students, as you might expect, that weren't exactly you know hitting the ball out of the park prior. Um, but this really just pushed them over. This is a straw that broke the, the camel's back. It really pushed them over the top. And 
um, we're working to try to figure out how to, to get them access to either high school completion program, GED programs, or in some situations to try to re-engage them with us in some kind of a, a flexible pathway model with the work-based learning or other types of things to get them engaged even a little bit to get some credits and keep them on, on track. Um, we have done as a, as a admin and counseling team, well over a hundred home visits, which again, if you think about, we only have, we have less than 300 kids. <laughs> That's a lot of home visits. A lot of them have been unsuccessful. A lot of them have been repeat visits. Mm -hmm. uh, I have seen some things in, in where kids live and how they live um, that I hope wouldn't shock you because you're legislators in Vermont, but it might shock you. Some of them are pretty shocking to me and um, I've been around for a while here. Um, Kids living in in um, tar covered shacks, um, decrepit trailers, up long, long winding, um, non maintained roads off of secondary and tertiary roads uh, up in the hills, um, and so it, it's it's really it's really uh, pretty sad when you get to see that firsthand, um, and and you and you understand really why the struggle to engage is real um, for these kids. Um, I'll, I'm going to leave you at the end of my, my testimony here with a little anecdote um, about one particular uh, individual. Uh, these guys also mentioned staffing challenges. Uh, we had a flurry of um, resignations, retirements in, in June. And I'm sure I know other districts have had that happen over the summer, as well as, as the reality of live instruction, um, you know, hit a teacher who was maybe very close, who would make the decision to just go um, because they'd be worried about their health. Um, uh, we have had um, one mid-year resignation. We have no subs on our sub list uh, for when we do start live. And I would say the staff morale, is particularly entering a budget season, <laughs> is not super high. Uh, we're doing our best to keep it light and keep them happy. The workforce um, uh, is, is ultra important. I think Erica highlighted this, and I want to highlight it again. We're very near Stratton and Mount Snow, and as my teachers report they're hearing stories about ski instructors getting vaccinated. Um, that is heart wrenching and heartbreaking to my staff. Um, we've heard of mental health workers who are doing strictly remote work um, getting vaccinated. And yet the teachers who are on the front lines uh, are, are not in that priority list. And um, I understand the, the challenge of prioritizing who gets it, who doesn't. And I understand that's an incredibly hard thing and it's based on the medical uh, expertise at the, at the governor's office and with the Department of Health, but it's, I can just tell you that that has been a, a gut punch to the to the faculty and staff of, of my building and I'm sure across the state. Um, so that's one thing I wanted to make sure I mentioned. Um, academic gaps, we talked a little bit about this and I loved Chris's uh, expression about uh, not using the word recovery, it's really about re-engagement. Um, we, you know, we're still dealing with students that didn't complete things from the spring. In our hope, we had a whole system set up to run in the fall, but then when we couldn't open, you're trying to re-engage kids to, to complete incompletes using a using virtual learning when the reason they had complete the first phase was virtual learning is, you know, is nonsensical. So we're we're really struggling with how to do that. We have developed a summer program for this year um, coming up, um, and um, you know we're really hoping that we can engage kids through our, our flex time um, during the school year. Um, in the spring once they're here live, but to try to engage them to make up work when they're remote is, is next to impossible. Uh, we do also have another plan in place to try to bring back and re-engage some of those students who have dropped out, who are on the fringe, um, and potentially use some extra money to do that. And uh, we're exploring that right now. Uh, and also, uh, we'll say this, we Chris was on the call. We do a weekly uh, principals call that the VPA organizes, and there was some conversation about offering uh, redos, if you will, to high schoolers who would choose to do redo junior year or redo senior year and what the implications of that could be and should be um, around ADM and everything else. And that's just something to be thinking about um, because if you're, if you're, you know, really worried about your junior year being such important for college consideration, the opportunity to redo that might be something that families might uh, wish to do. So we're, we're in considerations around those sorts of, uh, those sorts of things around re-engagement. Um, and I'll leave you with, with some stuff again about poverty. So our community uh, nears 50% free and reduced lunch rate. Um, and uh, that's obviously high, uh, higher than the state average. Um, but the home visits have led to a little ray of sunshine for us because as we've connected families with resources, one of the big, um, you know, we have some local churches that have helped out, but also the Stratton Foundation, I wanna make sure I mention their name. They have done an incredible amount of work giving 
um, for our, in our community, um, basically in the shadow of Stratton, as they call it, um, gift cards and, and presents and we had a Toys for Tots campaign. We even had a book campaign where our high school students through our leadership course um, collected used books and gifted them to the elementary students. So every elementary student in our district received a package of books uh, at the holidays, um, gift wrapped and collected by our high school kids. And uh, that was an incredible thing. Um, and we, we did this one particular thing that I want to come back to. Um, as we arrived to convince the student um, who's a special education student to not drop out, um, and he pointed at his own house and described, well, I'm kind of poor, you know, you can see from my house. And I mean, his, his, uh, his grasp of that was pretty, was pretty amazing. Um, and as we pushed him on, this is what we can do for you. This is what we can offer. We have this job set up for you in a, in a restaurant. We, through work-based learning, we have this, um, we can, we're going to be in school for two days a week anyways. And so on and so forth. As we described it, he turned to us and he said, and this, this struck me, it, it, it really, really took me a few minutes to kind of respond to this. And he said, why are you guys so obsessed with keeping me in school? And I thought, what a great line. And, you know, I think that you guys have educators across your state right now who are obsessed with keeping kids engaged in their, in their daily lessons, um, keeping kids engaged in, um, in school in general, and for this kid to keep him actually from dropping out. I think the work is being done in every community across uh, our state um, in doing that. And I just, um, that was just a really powerful anecdote I wanted to leave you with. But um, that is all I have. But thank you guys so much for, again for inviting us here. Thank you. It'll be open for questions. I just have a quick one for Bob first. You are participating with the secretary in a group on advising and participating in the development of guidance. Is that correct? Yeah, there's, so there's a there's a weekly uh, call that he does with what he calls the advisory committee, and there's, and there's representation from BSA, VSBA, VPA, obviously, um, a bunch of AOE folks and special ed administrators, and I mean it's 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 really everybody in the field, um, independent schools, the whole nine yards. Um, I'm involved in that. There's a separate subgroup of that that actually develops the guidance. I'm not on that particular group. Um, but but the it, the feedback that we give goes into should go into developing of that guidance as it as it goes forth. And you feel heard. Um, I would say, in that group, I would say generally yes. Uh, I mean, to be completely honest, um, I would say I'm sorry, my cell phone is ringing here. Um, I would say that the sports committee piece has been a little bit tougher. The restart there, um, the doctors in that committee have been amazing. Um, there's definitely been a push from the top of the governor's office to to start sports. And I absolutely understand why. And I think it speaks to the mental health needs of our kids and the needs to engage. Um, but I would say that some of us on that committee have felt not heard um, based on our concerns around uh, what could be perceived as um, the inconsistencies between sports and what's the academic situation. So for example, um, my students can't come and learn math four days a week, but they can go into a gym and have basketball practice. And the dichotomy of those two things has been challenging to explain when people ask it. I just say, I, I don't have an answer for that. Um, but I guess that's the best way to answer that question. <laughs> Thank you. Representative Coopley and then Representative Toof. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, that was going to be one of my questions. What is the, how, how are you dealing with the sports activities? But thank you for your answer. Um, the, other, the other thing that I'm hearing are that students are checking in in the morning so that they're counted there for the day. And after they check in, they leave for the day, as you refer to the blank screens, et cetera. Is, is, this, is that one of the reasons for your home visits? Or does that, is that happen? I think it's happening perhaps all over the state, but I can't speak to that. I suspect that it probably is. And the teachers talk about how they wait when the class ends to see whose black screen is still there. And that's how you tell who isn't really engaged. Um, yeah, so our home visits were, were really twofold. One, around the kids that weren't engaging at all, that the teachers wouldn't even hear from, wouldn't see on the screen, wouldn't get any work from. Um, and those were obviously our priority targets. And then the secondary group was a group who were there, 
but not engaging in any work or not engaging in conversation. So those became like, let's just check in and make sure we're okay. So yeah, those were sort of the two tiers of, uh, of the home visits. Just to follow up to that, um, do these students, are they aware that if they miss X number of days that they may not be eligible for graduation or going on to uh, further their days in another year of schooling? Uh, sure. Well, we, you know, we in Vermont now have the proficiency system. So um, the, the actual like time on learning isn't as essential as what is demonstrating that they have learned. But even even with that said, yes, I think uh, kids are struggling with that. I think that's real for them. It's, you know, teenagers are, if you remember back, I mean, we, as teenagers, mm -hmm. we didn't really recognize the long term impacts of our actions. And I think these kids are, are going through that and in the middle of the, the depression and the the um, the struggles they're having, a lot of them with their families. I think that's just shutting us out, shutting the schools out, and is a is a in some ways a coping mechanism at some levels too. Thank you, um, Representative Tooth. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you everyone to come in. I just want to mention to to uh, Erica, uh, Representative Hooper did text me and say he apologizes he couldn't make it in. He has a home energy audit today, and uh, so he's going to be watching this later. He'll probably reach out to you. Um, my question is along the same lines as Representative Coopley. Um, is there, and then we also have educators in the committee, so I'd, I'd be happy to hear um, from them as well. But with this ghosting, is there like a requirement for having their screen on, or they can just, it's, they don't have to, there's no requirement. They don't have to, they just have to basically log in and. Yeah, I mean, I can let, I can let Chris talk about that from the other standpoint, but for, for us, for the remote kids, yes, there is a requirement. Um, and they're marked off through their habits of learning grades um, th that they aren't demonstrating that they're engaged, uh, but that doesn't necessarily prevent the kids from turning in the actual assignments as well. So you got multiple kind of problems uh, with that. But I want to jump onto that. In a little, in some instances, it shouldn't be a requirement. We've got kids living in hotels, and they don't want you to see that they're living in a hotel, or they don't want their classmates to see that they're living in a hotel or in a shack with a tarp on top. So. There has to be some sensitivity to that as well, that teachers are navigating every day. Yeah, like a fine line, yeah. Representative Conlon. Uh, good morning, and I apologize for having one of those blank screens, but I've got an unstable internet. Um, could you talk a little bit as, at the elementary level and at the high school level, what you think, um, given or assuming that we're all vaccinated come September, what next year will look like or what the what the main number one goals will be um, uh, clearly engagement but um, just a little bit about what you think it'll look like how it might look different from a traditional normal year of schooling I don't mind starting I would say first in the forefront of my mind is uh, kids have been isolated in ways never they have before and so their socialization and being around multiple people is going to be a challenge and dysregulating for them. You know, as an elementary school, I have uh, 330 kiddos. And so my class sizes are pretty, pretty big for elementary classes. Like they can range from uh, 18 to 22. And having half of a class of nine or 10 kids in the room has definitely shown me a lot of regulation in terms of their body and ability to access learning. When I put 20 kids in a room after they've all been isolated, um, they're going to be dysregulated. And as you know, with the brain science, if you're dysregulated, feeling nervous or unsafe, you're not thinking and you're not focusing. And so there's going to be a lot of challenge getting kids to understand how their body's feeling, getting them to feel um, regulated so that they can access their prefrontal cortex for best learning. So I think that's going to be a big challenge and we have to remember that when we have the kiddos in those, um, you know, there's often in education world, we talk about the first six weeks of school, there's probably gonna need to be the first 12 weeks or more of, of that really building community and trust and, and feelings of safety. It, it looks very similar at, at the high school level. Um, our freshmen uh, at the end of this year will only have experienced hybrid learning in high school. And our sophomores will have experienced two thirds of their high school career in either a full closure or remote setting. Um, and so that's a, that's a real problem uh, when you start talking about 
a school community, a healthy and well school community. And so our efforts are going to be almost entirely uh, focused on rebuilding those connections and rebuilding that school community so that we can really start to dig in on where some of the academic issues may lie as a result of not having access to in-person instruction for so long. What's your, what's your um, staff background and experience in professional development in terms of social emotional learning? Implicit bias, those various issues of concern. <laughs> I have had, we've had extensive, sorry, Chris, go ahead. Well, it's, it was uh, this, we have, we've started, um, we started last year with a, a focus on trauma-informed instruction and have built what we call our wellness team, uh, our wellness team consists of a social worker, uh, a school counselor, uh, two therapists, and a substance abuse counselor, as well as a 504 enrichment coordinator. Um, that's in addition to our regular school counseling staff who are more focused on college and career preparation. Then um, that just started last year. And, and if we didn't have them, um, I, I would feel so much less confident that our students were being supported where they are with the social emotional learning. So they are taking the lead on much of the um, school wellness uh, planning. Um, I should also mention that they actually piloted and, and convinced me, which I think is a great idea, that uh, we, we, do we do student advisories, as many high schools do, um, where students are, have time set aside every day or at least a couple times a week to connect with both teachers as well as uh, peers that aren't necessarily in their classes. Uh, this has been invaluable to us to have this, these, these connections built into the day when students are in person. Uh, we also have staff advisory, uh, and this gets to the staff wellness piece where uh, it's time carved out every week. Uh, we, we actually, for our Wednesdays, uh, we have students come in uh, just a, a little bit later so that teachers have a half an hour Wednesday morning to get together with their advisory group and, and just talk. Um, what are their challenges? And that, that, is, that has really been um, a, a huge help to the staff to maintain some level of, of wellness for themselves also. So um, long answer to your question, uh, Representative Webb, but the, uh, we have spent quite a bit of time attending to uh, increasing teachers' capacity to address the social emotional learning in the school. And Erica, you wanted to add something? Yeah, I would say in the last two and a half years, uh, my district, we've we do it all together. Uh, we've done two and a half years of uh, coursework around the neurobiology of stress, the impacts of that on our staff and students, um, and including the vicarious trauma that our, that our staff experience working with high poverty at risk students, um, just because they care about them so much that it impacts them. Um, but that's not the case across the state. So if you asked 100 principals, you might get 100 different answers. Um, and so there's going to be some school communities that are more equipped at supporting students and families than, than others. Thank you. Representative Brady. I, it looked like Bob was gonna say something related oh. there. So go, please go ahead. I'm sorry, I just wanted to add on to what Erica was saying that uh, my school also has had the same training that she's had for the last three years, and, but she's right, the, the disparity is, is out there. And, and a similar point to that, um, and even when you think about the services that are available outside of schools for, for students and families, that is also greatly varied across the state. Mental health agencies are different from, from region to region, as you know. Um, and, and of course, what, what the capacity of DCF is within your region is also gonna vary. So um, yeah, those things will also create quite, quite a variance. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I apologize. There's a remote band class in the background at, um, at my house because we have, um, but my kids are, are doing quite well. They have a lot of opportunities in this that I know are not universal across the experiences. Um, I just want to thank all three of you. You're, I was emotional at times listening to that testimony and I teach in a high school. So none of this is, is news to me. Um, but I think the way that you, um, raised some very succinct and important points. Um, I think particularly thinking of middle and high school as re-engagement, um, much of that maps very much onto my experience. I had to jump off this morning and teach a class to mostly blank screens. Um, and, 
and the social studies teacher. So we've discussed a lot of the events of the last week. And like you said, uh, Chris, it's, um, it's a very one-way discussion right now. In many ways, a lot of the sort of best practices we know about teaching kind of got thrown out this year and we had to, to go to some very traditional practices. And I, I worry that won't <clears throat> go away overnight. Um, my question really is about what you think it will take um, I think we heard some important points this morning from the superintendents about nothing new. This isn't the time for new policies and you know new things from the state. But what it will take to do to do the old to to do um, you know school again in a um, in a way that we're more accustomed to, because my fear is that there will be this sort of just back to normal next year, and that means one or two days of in service. You open the doors, you write your schedule as you used to. Um, and, you know, I think one thing we had going for us this year was that that delayed start having, I can't imagine how we would have opened Colchester High School without those 12 days to really get ready for um, a very different physical and educational experience. And that probably won't happen again. Um, so I, I guess I really worry about what, how do we prepare, what do schools need in order to not just sort of revert back to everything as usual in the fall when there's there's no way that's where kids and teachers really are. I think that's a really good question. Um, and certainly one I would want to talk about with the staff, but I would concur with you that having those days in advance was maybe the first time in my entire educational career that we could be extremely planned, thoughtful, and have time to learn and think together. Because in education, we're always flying the plane while we're building it. And it's not effective or efficient, but this was. And our teachers are rocking it because we've had that time in advance for planning. And even we built in some sort of early release days so that we can have that continuous planning along the way. And so with hands down, I would, I would agree with you and we would need that time in advance. The problem is often in Vermont, every district is having to negotiate all of those same things. We all spin our wheels about the same things. And I was begging in the spring, could we just have some common agreements across the state so that all efforts on like the local level isn't like negotiating these side deals with their local unions. Um, but, it, but that's how we do it and it's, it's hard. So if, we, if that was a gift that we could have where we would have time in advance of the school year where everyone had that would be amazing. It'd be a really great start. I would just add to that too. I think definitely no new stuff is going to be important to, to consider. Um, I think whatever you guys can do legislatively around the tax relief stuff around the, the funding formula, I think it's going to be important because as we all know that, that with the loss of revenue from um, rooms and meals and sales that, that the Ed Fund is, is taking a beating on that. And so um, we just can't, we can't think short-sighted that that's, that now's the time to really slash and burn what's happening at the individual school and district level, because now we're going to need the resources the most as we just it's described. Um, but so things like for me in, in my region, things like the waiting study are going to have, could potentially have a significant impact on tax relief that wouldn't rely on cutting programs at the time when we need it the most. Um, things like that, I think would be what I would ask for. I can just chime in very quickly. I agree with, with both Bob and Erica. Um, my, I have, my thinking has not extended beyond summer at this point. Um, so I, uh, and that's, that's a stretch. So I, I worry about the impact of, 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 of trying to um, schedule students in a way that, that meets them where they are and what impact that's going to have on staffing. Uh, I think that's a, a real problem. Um, and I'll just give you a quick, quick anecdote about one thing that would help is about three weeks ago, um, I got a, the letter, a letter from um, AOE and from my superintendent notifying us that our graduation rate had dropped uh, more than what was uh, considered acceptable. And, and I, I'm like, you gotta be kidding me. <laughs> I, I know it dropped. I know exactly who the students are. I know where they live. We've done so much work to try to re-engage them. And then we went through the data and, and it was, the data was wrong. 
Uh, we, we, we found nine students that had been erroneously counted as not graduate who had. And so um, any, anything that can be done that removes what in retrospect now might be somewhat artificial or superficial indicators of student uh, engagement and success and achievement, you know, maybe we, we could look at those a little differently uh, than we, we have in the past. Thank you. Um, Representative James. Thanks, Chair Webb. Uh, we heard testimony um, earlier today that um, in some schools anyway, harassment and hazing and bullying was down. And I wondered if that was your experience as well. Um, and whether it's, you know, simply because students aren't spending as much time together uh, or whether, I mean, I know that so much of that takes place online, whether hopefully <laughs> they're experiencing any kind of up, up to, up, uptick in empathy because they're, you know, having a common experience. I, I was just curious about your, um, your take on that. I can start, we, we've had um, hardly any discipline problems at all. Uh, and we do, we have investigated several online uh, bullying and harassment incidents, but it has been uh, less than previous years. And uh, I wish I could attribute it to an increase in empathy. I, I don't, I, I don't know. <laughs> uh, my, my guess is it, it, it goes back to my, my anecdote about the classes that I think kids are just kind of numb. And I, I think that the to Bob's point about his home visits and, and students shielding themselves from school, I, I, think, um, I think it more has to do with that than, than necessarily any, any change in, um, in their thinking around um, empathy. And, um, I would say at the elementary level, um, we have had a significant decrease, like hardly any discipline problems as well in terms of when they're in the building. I think the class size, the small class size matters a lot. Um, if you ever have a chance to listen to any of Bruce, Dr. Bruce Perry's work, he's an, I think an international speaker, frankly. And um, he talks a lot about the relational milieu and how we are um, lacking that in our current days. Remember the, the, the olden days when you would have several family members living in the home. You'd have grandma and grandpa right next door or the aunts and uncles that were nearby. And all of those relationships matter to the success and the well-being of the children. And now you see a lot of homes with single parents and multiple children or you know, adults coming and going or working multiple jobs. And so they don't have that relational connection like they had years and years past. And that matters to our society today. And what was so obvious when we had half the class, that decrease in um, challenge and behaviors was what I believe attest to attesting to that um, increase of relationship with teacher um, and connection. And online, uh, the same. They have regular meets with the, at the elementary level throughout their day with their teachers. You do see the children's faces on the, at the elementary level and they're so happy to be there. <laughs> um, and we have su great supervision at the school levels with like Go Guardian, where they can supervise the children's electronics. Um, and so we have very quick responses when a kid starts Googling some inappropriate content. That's been our bigger challenge than it is the inappropriateness between peers. Are there any other questions? I don't have Jay here right now, but I, I actually returned about uh, half an hour, 20 minutes ago. So I, I apologize for being absent. This sounds like it was a really productive and important conversation, which I'm going to review later on. So long as uh, maybe Jesse can send me a link, but I was busy with a home energy audit and uh, it turns out that uh, maybe I should have voted for the legislative pay increase because I think uh, it's going to get expensive. But just thank you for uh, entertaining. Thank you, Jay. I, I 
glad that you were able to be here for at least part of it. And, and, and please do. I think that we've had some very important testimony give us, giving us an idea as to uh, what is happening in the field. We are still going to be hearing from the school boards. We're going to be hearing from the teachers. And we have some guidance counselors coming in to talk with us, which is very important. And if you could work with your association to help um, organize that into a concise list of the things you would like us to do and also the things you want to make sure that we don't do if we all of a sudden get so excitingly creative about something that's going to take us down at just a terrible direction, which we have been known to do. Um, so if you if you wouldn't mind working with um, with with the principals association to to have him ready with your with a concise list, it would be most appreciated appreciated. It's significantly harder to work under these conditions than we do when I have have the folks coming into the committee and we're checking in at now and then. Um, so um, a, a printed list is very helpful for those of us with aging memory anyway. Um, this has been very informative, um, really appreciated hearing uh, from, the, from the principals and superintendents. And I think we're going forward with some very interesting ideas. The good news is I'll say to you is we do have some more money coming in. Uh, I think it's about 130 million. I can't remember 127 million. I think for for uh, pre-K 12, with some extra money that the governor can spend, um, where we will be taking a look at um, how we might be able to relate the work of Act 173 to uh, learning loss and what are you calling it now? I like that better. Learning recovery. What was the other one? You had a good term for it. Re-engagement. Yes, re-engagement, re-engagement of learners um, to see if there's a way that we can draw together some of those, those concepts. We will be looking at, at financing as we always do. I know some folks have brought up the concern about the excess spending threshold. I'm expecting we're gonna be seeing something about that as well. This is clearly a very unusual year. Uh, I personally uh, take your, your warnings and your, your uh, recommendations um, seriously and, and please do keep us informed. Um, and I thank you and we can, we can go off live. <laughs> thank you.